All right, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and get started even as people join. So um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar in the 2020 Fall Winter Science Seminar Series brought to you by the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, otherwise known as CCASC or Southeast CASC. So in this virtual seminar series, we'll be highlighting CCASC funded projects that support resource management actions across the Southeast. My name is Carrie Furness, and I am the program manager here at the Southeast CASC. Um, so yeah, here we go. So here's what to expect from today's webinar. We'll first go over a little bit of meeting logistics um, and then introduce, introduce our speaker for the day who you probably know is Jacob LaFontaine. He'll present for about 40 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll have some time for um, Q&A at the end before we just wrap up with a quick preview of the next um, presentations lined up in this series. So now I'll pass the mic over to Ashlyn Shore, our, the communication specialist for the CCASC, who'll give us a quick intro to our Zoom interface. Thanks, Gary, and good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I'd like to just quickly cover some of the features of the Zoom interface that we're going to be using for the webinar, although I'm sure at this point everyone's pretty much a Zoom expert. Um, but just as noted, um, on the slide right down here. Um, these controls on the bottom left that you'll see on your Zoom screen will allow you to connect to audio using either your computer audio or through your phone. Um, the number is listed on the meeting link information you received and it's also listed right here. Um, this is also where you can mute and unmute your audio. So we will keep all lines muted throughout the presentation, and we ask that you just keep your video off so we can keep distractions to a minimum during the presentation. Um, so in the middle of the bottom bar of your Zoom screen, you can access the chat window. And I'd encourage you if questions come up during the presentation, just to submit them in the chat for discussion after the talk. Um, we will be monitoring those questions there and we'll pose them to our speaker during the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. So just a quick note for those who may be joining us only by phone, um, star six is the code to mute or unmute your phone if you have a question. Um, and lastly, just to let you all know, we will be recording today's webinar. So you can access that recording afterwards on the Southeast Task website, on our science series webpage and on our YouTube channel. So we'll make sure those links are all shared out with you all as well. So I'll pass it back to you, Carrie. Thanks, Ashlyn. Um, so now we'd like to launch a short poll just to get a bit of information about who's with us today and to sort of help us know how to continue to get information out about these webinars. So um, we'll give you just a half a minute or so to fill this out. Um, so hopefully this gives an idea also to our presenter about who's in the room with us today and um, what to anticipate as far as uh, potential um, information needs. So yeah, we've got about half people in if you want to keep those rolling in for another, give you about another 10 seconds or so. All right, I'll go ahead and close this and share out the results. So it looks like we're predominantly from federal agencies, but um, some nice representation from universities, state agencies, local and NGOs. So Nice to see that broad um, representation here. And it looks like our newsletter wins with uh, getting the word out. So glad that you all learned about this and um, hopefully we, you can uh, consider joining for future ones. So now on to our presentation. So I'm pleased to introduce Jacob LaFontaine, who's a research hydrologist in the USGS South Atlantic Water Science Center based in Norcross, Georgia. His research focuses on the development of local, regional, and national scale hydrologic models, providing hydrologic information for historical and potential future conditions of climate, land cover, and water use. His current work focuses on characterizing the hydrologic cycle, improving understanding of hydrologic processes, and improving existing modeling capabilities at the national scale. So he'll be talking with us today about results from some of his recent CCASC research assessment of water availability and stream flow characteristics in the southeastern U.S. for current and future climatic and landscape conditions. Now, take it away, Jacob. Go ahead and okay. share out your... Uh, and 
that's showing out. The yeah, time slot. perfect. Okay. And we can Great. hear you loud and clear. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending today. I uh, hope everybody's uh, managing to stay safe and, and maintain through these uh, interesting times. Uh, USGS, we've uh, it's been few and far between that I've been to the office in the last six months. So I've definitely gotten used to working, teleworking and uh, getting used to being on video on the computer all the time, it seems like. So thanks for joining and uh, hopefully you'll find some of this information, you know, uh, can apply or be carried forward um, in your work as well. So brief overview. So try to give, give some historical perspective of um, how we, kind of got to the point of developing the tools that allowed us to really um, carry this work forward to completion um, and give a brief overview of the USGS National Hydrologic Model and then also the modeling applications in the Southeast. So uh, as I'll get to some of this, you know, work started as a previous project and then uh, was expanded and extended um, through CCASC as well. And then looking at future directions based on the needs or you know things that we weren't able to characterize in the current applications, but we think are very valuable, you know, to to further characterize historical and future hydrologic conditions. So in general, you know, from a, a USGSA research perspective in the water mission area, you know, we really look to in general provide use, useful hydrologic information, you know, to resource managers, to stakeholders. You think about USGS, you know, the first thing that probably comes to mind from water is our stream gauge network and all the, the data that are collected across the country uh, every day and, and are displayed on the web. Um, but then we also have, you know, analyses of those data model applications that use those, those data sets, you know, to, uh, to take the next step and, and provide uh, additional information. Uh, with the modeling efforts, you know, uh, Back when we had the National Research Program in USGS, you know, groups specifically, you know, we were part of the Modeling Watershed Systems uh, Research Project and NRP, you know, looking at uh, improving hydrologic model simulations, adding capabilities that, you know, would further improve our simulations for, for users um, and, and to answer the questions. And, and so with the uh, reorganization in 2016 of, of the water mission area, some of those things have changed and how, how, how water mission area looks and is organized. Water science centers, you know, are still uh, the same, but, but some of that, that research has been uh, reorganized. And so living within that new realm of the organization um, and then carrying this work forward. So typically, you know, we think about hydrologic models, you look at, you know, the literature in the past, you know, typically you had a particular watershed of interest, you know, you had a stream gauge associated with it. Uh, there was a particular question that, you know, uh, the users or the, the stakeholders had. And, and so they're relatively small uh, applications. Um, and that's kind of how the, the modeling software was designed to me. But then in, in building off of the prediction and unengaged basins effort, you know, that decade long effort of, you know, how can we transfer information that we know about gauged areas and how we develop models and then how can we get information to places where we don't have, you know, observations or measurements, you know, to, to try and provide information to answer questions. And, and so we've seen over even like just the, the ramping up over the last 10 years that we've, you know, been doing these efforts um, that I've been involved in and, you know, starting at say a basin scale and then we've moved to regional and now we're doing national scale modeling. Um, in the water mission area as well as you know you see other efforts inside and outside of usgs that you know folks getting to that that scale and and a lot of that being uh supported by you know increases in computing power you know having more data sets that we can we can say something about uh larger areas so this report by julie kiang and others in usgs looked at a uh, in 2013 looked at a gap analysis of the stream gauge network uh, that usgs maintains and you know, when we look at what we typically would use, say, to calibrate a model or develop models, you know, we, we typically start with a natural flows or a, a reference quality, you know, network for for the uh, the model developments. But in this figure on the right shows for the southeast that those light blue areas are what we would say the areas that are gauged 
that are considered reference quality. And that's a distinction that was, was made in the Gages 2 data set by James Falcone in, in 2010. And, and some of that work was uh, with an aqua program. And so, you know, in what is reference or non-reference, you know, there's assumptions made that maybe uh, reference for a particular application, but maybe for another application, you know, some of those um, wouldn't apply. But when we look at, there's a lot of white area in the Southeast where we don't have that perhaps baseline information. You may have stream gauge information, but those stream gauges are probably anthrop anthropogenically affected by flow regulation, water use, uh, urbanization. So we need methodologies to provide that water availability in those ungaged areas and impacted watersheds. Uh, so our motivation, it's been almost 10 years now since we kind of started this national uh, modeling exercise and framework building in the USGS it was originally part of that MOES project. And so looking at, you know, how do we characterize water availability, you know, changes in the timing and the source of flow across the country, how can we assess uncertainty in those, those, uh, those predictions or those projections, or even in the observation data sets that we rely on either directly or as, as model development. Um, you know, bringing in characterizing climate and land use change, and then also looking across a range of scales. Um, so, you know, there may be just a, a local question or that's something that applies regionally or just having that national context. So the National Hydrologic Model that we uh, started developing back in 2011, 2012, you know, we're trying to provide nationally consistent, uh, locally informed stakeholder relevant uh, information. So the NHM infrastructure, it's, uh, has three main parts to it. Um, there's the physical models, then there's the underlying geospatial fabric or the modeling units or for, for how we typically look at things, you know, the spatial polygons of the watersheds are hydrologic response units, and then they're connected to a stream network of stream segments. And then also we have an initial parameterization or a post calibration parameterization of that, of that modeling application. And then looking at input data is that that would drive the model. So, so for the, the model that we use for the daily time step, you know, precipitation, daily precipitation accumulation and daily maximum minimum temperature, uh, those tend to probably be the, uh, the bare minimum of inputs to general, you know, hydrologic models, but then other models may need other things as well. Um, so for our application on the projects that I'll talk about today, uh, the, net, the NHM application of the precipitation runoff modeling system was the, the final tool that was used. Um, so the PRMS was um, originally developed in the early 80s and has been uh, developed over the years. And we have new versions. And I think so the latest version is, is five, version 5.1 that was released this past year. Um, and so we look to always add new capabilities where we can. And, and keep the, the code updated. So it's a deterministic model, distributed parameters across the landscape, provides daily time step uh, simulations of the various parts of the water budget. So each of these uh, boxes and uh, you know, represent different parts of the hydrologic cycle that, that we can provide outputs with fluxes and storages, you know, ins and outs in the simulation um, as, as folks may need them. The other model that is in the NHM infrastructure is the monthly water balance model. So this is based off the Thornthwaite water balance model. So much more simplistic parameterization, uh, very efficient. And we actually use these models um, in partnership as we get to that those final simulations. So uh, much work has been done with the water balance model also uh, to look at climate change impacts across the country, which I'll reference uh, here shortly. Then we have the underlying geospatial fabric. So for this app, you know, typically in the past, say 10 years ago, we were doing, all right, where's the, the, uh, the national digital elevation model? Let's clip out the DEM. We're gonna process that from scratch, you know, put stream gauge locations in there and break it up into our model units. Well, now for the NHM, we've used the NHD plus uh, data set. So originally we used the version one data set as our base layer. Um, to, to build up our, our modeling network, you know, based on points of interest like stream gauges, uh, ins and outs of reservoirs, you know, trying to make no unit too large. Um, so we would have to split some things into the hydrologic response units and segments. Um, so that was published back in 2014. And then one of the issues when we talk about, you know, modeling fidelity versus, 
you know, computing power? And do we have, you know, data sets of enough detail to really parameterize some hyper resolution application? Um, what we had did at the time for the NHM was, you know, so the NHD plus version one native resolution has, you know, almost 3 million of these catchments, which, which are like the HRUs. And so what we did is aggregate those up into something that was manageable that we could run for the country with our computing resources. So we aggregated those up to about 110,000 hydrologic response units and about 55,000 stream segments to, uh, to book, get this national application. And then that's overlaying and parameterized with various data, spatial data sets, vegetation, impervious area, national land cover data sets, soils, uh, the terrain, topography, to get all the parameters uh, in an initial condition. And then as far as climate data sets, so there's a lot of, you know, so a lot of folks will use uh, native resolution, you know, just the uh, NCDC weather stations, uh, but there's also a lot of products that have come out that are either gridded uh, derivations of those station data or use other products as well, remotely sensed products, radar. So for the NHM, these, these data sets are what we've uh, resampled those grids to, uh, to our model polygon so that we can run the model in a variety of configurations. So there's two versions of the Daymet uh, product. There's a, what we call an Idaho, that's the GridMet product that was out of uh, University of Idaho. I think they've since moved to UC Merced. Um, there's a Livna data set as well that goes a little bit further back than the rest. The Mauer data set uh, was originally developed in 2002. There was a more recent update, which pushed it through 2010. Mauer, the Mauer data set is what tipped a lot of the downscaling of the, uh, the general circulation models is what we've used you know, as, as our base layer. And then stage four radar. Um, so one of our research objectives uh, in past years has been to try and see what's, you know, is there something, is there something different? You know, what do we, is one data set better for us than another? You know, when when are they uh, applic you know, applicable or not? And then when it comes to the climate change simulations, we need to make sure we calibrate our model to the base data set that the GCMs were downscaled to. So for the regional application uh, to get to this, this work, uh, so what I would call phase one is what started up in 2014. So this work was uh, funded by the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks, LCC, Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Um, and also uh, had some funding from the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. And so this focused uh, in the Southeast part of the US. So the blue line outlines what was the extent of that, that phase one. Um, so the GCPO LCC is this purplish area. And so with the additional funding from the, the CASC, you know, we finished out these, these um, watersheds or basins to the east uh, as well, because um, so that we, maintained our, our continuity for high, you know, for the watersheds um, on the eastern side. And so this really was focused on providing these foundational data sets to the GCPO and, and some of their analysis and what they did when they were, you know, planning for, you know, what are the data needs, what's the condition of the existing information that we have, uh, and, and providing that for historical and future. You know, so they, they looked at, you know, define, design and deliver, you know, these landscapes capable of sustaining these natural and cultural resources. And so within their vision and their mission statements, you know, they looked at a variety of the data sets that would be applicable for, for folks to, to do management activities uh, across their region. And, and fitting into this strategic framework of, you know, the various players and the various things that um, would influence that, that area and trying to look at where they were, what they had, what they didn't have, you know, so that you could get to this common understanding and, and talk in a framework where everybody under various partners understood. Um, so, so there is this desired state for wildlife that they had defined. Um, so looking at this, you know, upland high gradient streams and rivers aspect. And so there's a variety of these, uh, pieces that they wanted to classify. So, you know, maintaining current river miles, you know, so a, a five means, you know, we've, we've got that pretty well defined. A one means that we need that information still. And so what happened is, you know, in the uh, RFP that they put out, 
uh, in 2014 is that these these categories that related to flow you know the various flow regimes groundwater low flows moderate you know uh, all of those things were they needed improvement needed information and so that tied with our motivation to kind of look at these limited availability of you know reference quality information or minimally impacted gauge coverage and then needing new methodologies to provide that information really tied well with what we were doing in, in USGS from the hydrologic perspective. So the project objective in this phase one is develop this multi-model synthesis. So what we found is, you know, we had been a part of several model intercomparison studies where you may have had various physically based models, statistically based models, and, you know, comparing which one does better here, there for which flow regimes. And, you know, really what you find out is that it really depends. It depends on which question, which part of the, you know, the hydrograph you're interested in. Uh, are you just looking at historical? Are you looking at historical plus future? You know, you're trying to do scenarios to where no one model really, you know, came out as the answer for everything. And so we tried to move forward from this competing models to bring them together. And so where we have, you know, the daily PRMS model the monthly water balance model, and then also statistically based methods. We look to bring those together and use them to inform uh, the final modeling product. And so our delivery was for these flow characteristics, you know, uh, various hydrologic, you know, stream flow metrics, you know, you think about the indicators of hydrologic alteration, you know, so there's these five overarching categories of different flow statistics. So duration, frequency, magnitude, rate of change and timing, and then the numbers and parentheses of the, the, the subset of those that we actually used on this project. So there was a total of 52 statistics that we computed uh, out of the model simulation. So for the historical data sets, you know, pulling from the, the, the USGS, uh, the GeoData portal is a great resource for getting these gridded climate products and then actually getting them remapped to your modeling units or, or units of interest for other reasons. Uh, so we used that Mauer product that was, uh, the, the future climate set data sets were downscale too. Um, so the future data sets were out of the CMIT five, the couple model into comparison project phase five. Uh, so the daily time step forcings of temperature and precipitation from 1950 to 2100. Uh, and so they're broken out by these four different representative concentration pathways. Uh, so the emission scenarios of old, you know, the SRES, from previous uh, CMIP runs, and so you look at, you know, what do we what do we think that, based on certain decisions, those those radiative forcings will be, and then seeing what the hydrologic response is with those various forcings, um, and so for you know, for this project, you know, the GCM based climate data sets again were available through the GeoData portal, and at the time that we did this phase one. Uh, so right now there's a total of 44 historical general circulation models and then those have anywhere from two to four of those RCP scenarios attached to them. So there's 134 of those future simulations now there was a subset at the time available on the geodata portal back in 2014 that we had selected and those were statistically downscaled uh, using the bias corrected constructed analogs methodology. So here's a breakdown of the various GCMs that we used, there was 13 of the GCMs we used and they had anywhere again from two to four of those scenarios uh, for a total of uh, 58 of our uh, simulations that were used in this work. Also incorporated historical and potential future land cover. So uh, Terry Soule and others up at the Aero Center in South Dakota with USGS had developed these products where it gave an annual time step of these general land cover categories, not as detailed as national land cover data set, but still looking at the, the large categories from 1940 up through 2100. And so we use those to look at, you know, how can we change things in the model like dominant land cover or impervious area or uh, changes in vegetation um, as we moved forward in the simulations. So I won't touch too much on this. If folks have questions later, I'll be more than happy to, to talk calibration. I could probably talk it all day, but I definitely don't want to uh, lull anybody to sleep with, with the intricacies of model calibration. But suffice it to say that we, based on the information we had and, and the modeling units, you know, where we had, say, reference stream gauges, um, different parts of the model got 
more or less calibration. So we had a three-step calibration where we calibrated each model unit independently based on data sets that we had at that resolution, like runoff out of the water balance model, uh, actually evapotrate inspiration products, snow water equivalent products. And then once that was done, we looked at headwaters. So collections of smaller watersheds that didn't include these large main stem gauges that we <clears throat> could then look at stream flow timing. And we actually used the statistically derived uh, stream flow time series in that step. So we were targeting the statistical stream flow to, to optimize our PRMS model in that step and looking at various flow regimes. And then the third step was bringing in the USGS stream gauge information that we had in those headwaters as, as a, final, a final round of calibration in, in this three-step process. And so when we look at simulation results out of that phase one study, you know, you look at whether changes in temperature across the region, changes, potential changes in precipitation and runoff. And, you know, where we see these, you know, so it's kind of a winter, spring, summer, fall, as we go through these panels for each of these. So what are the seasonal changes that we uh, could encounter? But then this is just kind of the median of those future uh, predictions. And so when we look, you know, for this, this analysis, we did combine them all uh, for the current phase two that I'll talk about, we, you know, are breaking them out by the RCP scenarios. But so you look at into the future, this, this black line representing the, you know, say the, the running average change into the future of air temperature. And then you have, you know, these uh, bands of you know the 25th and 75th percentile, the 95th and 5th, and then the max and the min across all of those uh, GCM-based uh, runs. So you know, looking at what you know, even though we we took the median for the black line, there's quite a range across uh, each of those different uh, GCM-based scenarios, and it happens you know for each each of the pieces. Um, you know, so temperature could have uh, drastically different uh, results. Precipitation, you know. The median, it doesn't have it changing, you know, a whole lot, you know, this seems pretty stable, but then when you look at, you know, the range and then also look at the spatial, uh, you know, the spatial changes. So, you know, maybe it's getting wetter in the summer, you know, in the Eastern part of the study area, but it's getting drier in the summer, you know, less precipitation in the Western part of the, uh, of the study area. And so, so we kind of have this temporal as well as spatial dynamics and, and how to, to look at this and summarize. And then in the runoff as well, you know, looking at runoff across the landscape. And, you know, we tend to see with this red, you know, maybe a, a general decrease in runoff, but then we do have these little blue areas, uh, kind of look like donuts around the urban areas, you know, as uh, the suburbs getting developed, you know, increasing impervious area, you know, vegetation perhaps decreasing. But there is a limitation on that in that, you know, in a previous smaller scale effort, we did look at, <clears throat> You know, can we incorporate offsets that would happen as a as a you know product of best management practices getting put in, like you know retention ponds, storage ponds that would mitigate some of these these potential increases in, in runoff. Uh, but that <clears throat> wasn't included at this scale for this study. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, looking at these simulation results, um, one of the great things about this phase one project was that. Um, Yvonne Allen, who was with Fish, is with Fish and Wildlife Service, um, uh, she took the modeling outputs that we were developing, and then she added these various metrics into their uh, the time as the GCPO LCC's uh, conservation planning atlas. So currently, um, these are fresh pulls from from the conservation atlas. So for each of the fifty two statistics that were computed, as well, you know, there's what did the historical show from the historical simulation, then what was the uh, potential change in the future from that historical condition by each of the hydrologic response units, by each of the stream segments. And then we also, I'll show here in a minute, um, some simulation, some evaluation of those, those metrics into the future. Um, so, you know, and so this is, you know, March. So the, the MA14 statistic, which is the mean March flow, and we see you know, the distribution of the flows and then look at the changes where, where red means, you know, you're maybe seeing decreases in that monthly. Um, and then the lighter colors, probably not so much change and then the blue potential increases. And then you look at July, you know, so uh, if we get you know, 
each of the months are represented in those metrics. Uh, you know, in the summary report, we have a table of all of those to explain what specifically they are. Uh, and then from a model evaluation, so looking at you know what we as you know hydro hydrologic modelers would look at as performance of of the models. You know, so looking at what's the Nash Sutcliffe index result, which is you know one of the favorite uh, metrics. You know, probably that you see in the literature, but it's one of those things where everybody uses it, but it may have some issues as far as you know characterizing the the full hydrograph. Um, so that incorporates both volume and timing performance, and then percent bias, looking at just volumes of, of water. Um, so, so for all the gauges, for, for the 169 reference gauges in the study area and the 896 non-reference gauges in the study area, we kind of look at the distribution of that Nash Sutcliffe. So Nash Sutcliffe, a one means you fit the observations perfectly. <clears throat> a zero means you're doing as good as if you just use the mean flow for the observations, you know, to represent the observations, and then negative means you're you're worse than than the average. So, you know, point depending on who you talk, to, you know, it's you know, say a 0.5 is considered you know relatively acceptable model. So, so really for the reference gauges, you know, we're up around like 85 percent of those stream gauges representing, you know, something perhaps acceptable in in representing the uh, the, the hydrograph. When we look at it spatially. Uh, so blue, the blue values are, are higher Nash Sutcliffe values, uh, with the oranges and reds being lower performance. So for the reference gauges on, on the left, you know, by and large, the reference gauges look like they're doing very well. Uh, there are some outliers. Um, and then you expect the non-reference gauges to probably not perform as well because we're simulating natural flows and those gauges tend to be anthropogenically affected by a variety of reasons. And we look at percent bias. Uh, so here, the black means we're within 10% of the observed uh, volumes. And then the lighter shades of, of uh, red or orange or blue mean that we're you know, within 25%. So again, similar story where we have more outliers in the non-reference than the reference gauges. But when we talk about, so that you know, from model evaluation from a general circulation model based runs, so you know we have all of the we have the observation based historical run we have the historical runs for the gcms which go through to you know 1950 to 2005 then we have the future runs of, of the gcm based uh, data sets so what we did you know we computed these stream flow statistics for the observation run the historical and future gcm based runs and then for on an annual time step and so we have a distribution of those statistics for the historical periods. So what we did was use the Komogorov Smirnov or the KS statistical test, which looks at, you know, is the distribution of one set equal, you know, within the population, the same population as another. So we looked, we were uh, going on the premise that we would say that we have confidence in the GCM based runs if we saw that there was uh, statistical similarity or, or non-difference in the historical representations of the observation-based and the GCM-based runs. So we did that by statistic, by model unit um, for, for each of the runs. And so an acceptance criteria that frankly we, you know, uh, came up with on the project. And, and this is one of the things that, you know, having others with other perspectives across say, you know, the climatology community or others, you know, and other of the um, related fields, you know, we decided that, you know, if 75% of the model units of a particular run passed KS test for 75% of the GCMs, we felt that we were pretty confident that, you know, the GCMs were representing that, you know, fairly well. So the, so the thresholds for the hydrologic response units, you know, 15,188 out of the 20,000 HRUs that were in the, this model subset, and then the segments just over 8,000 of the 10,000, and then across 10 of the 13 GCMs. So we have this, these tables built by GCM and by stream flow metric. So this is the duration category and looking at which of the model runs, you know, pass those criteria. And so what we tend to see, you know, is that as these numbers go up, that is the, uh, the time step or aggregation of the, the uh, model simulation goes up. So like, you know, if a DH1 
is the one day high. You know, the, the five is the 90 day average high, you know, so it's like one, three, seven, 30 days. So, you know, we tend to see things that get aggregated together on longer time steps or aggregated over perhaps larger areas. We're able to fit those better with the simulations than the shorter time step uh, processes. So when we look at those two, so one that matched and one that, you know, met that criteria and one that did not. So this information is also up on the conservation planning atlas. And, and so on the left is that one day high flow. And so what we did is, is broke them up, you know, the black means that none of the GCMs could, you know, statistically match what the observation based run did. Then you go from the gray meaning more and then to the green means more of the GCMs were meeting, you know, we're, we're matching the historical observation distributions. So, so where we had, you know, these across all the models and then for the DH1, none of them, you know, so it still shows that even though as we lump this together to come up with some kind of criteria, there are still parts of the model that, you know, perhaps you can get some information about particular statistics about. And then, you know, and, and, and so there's opportunities to dive in and see is it particular characteristics or, you know, what are the characteristics of those watersheds that perhaps makes this possible. Um, and looking at another category, some magnitude. So these typically are, you know, the monthly flows, uh, coefficient of variation, looking at, um, at those types of metrics. And so for March, so where the MA14 is the March and MA18 is the July flows, uh, we see, you know, the March is, you know, we're, we're feeling pretty good about those simulations for that month, but then summertime, there's some regions that you know we're we're not getting that that statistical match, and you think about you know perhaps is it because you're dealing with uh, is it is it frontal storms versus you know convective storm you know for different parts of the year are there certain things like that that are driving what the models are able to reproduce or not, and so we also have these other three categories of frequency, rate of change, and timing. When we look at rate of change and timing, you'll see that. You know, we really don't have, even though we've computed those metrics and look at them, you know, there's some work to do or, you know, looking at what is the skill possible in the models for those metrics. Um, but those are like, you know, rising limb, falling limb. Uh, when did the peak, you know, the, or timing is when did the peak of the year occur? Uh, uh, typically things like that. So out of this phase one, we had, uh, you know, the summary report, USGS SIR, scientific investigations report, and that has the links to the data products. So we have a science-based data release, and then also where you're able to visualize up on the conservation planning atlas. So the data release is through science-based that has the model inputs, the outputs, the, the GIS information um, that folks are able to dig in to these results past the summaries that we've provided. And the Conservation Planning Atlas is great, uh, great tool. Again, you know, Vaughn Allen really led the effort on, um, on getting this populated. And so this allows for each, you know, each of the statistics looking at historical changes in the future, as well as that, um, that statistical analysis to look at our, you know, our confidence in, in those results. Um, you know, so from the, you know, as um, we move forward, with that information, you know, it's like from the perspective of say the LCCs or conservation, you know, it's like taking this information, what are they able to do for, for management across the landscape, right? Um, you know, are they able to take it, these information, develop follow on modeling studies, um, you know, ecosystem service models. Um, and then this third one is, is definitely a, a point of, discussion and ongoing discussion, just as we're getting these huge data sets, all this information, you know, developing user-friendly interface, interfaces or being able to tie into existing infrastructure to, to share these results or really subset them where somebody may not need the entire area, but just needs a particular part of interest. So this expansion, uh, expansion of the modeling effort, uh, it was funded, you know, so it's uh, late 2018. So 2019-20 is kind of where the, the majority of the project timeline is. And we're, you know, finishing this up now. It's definitely been interesting with this uh, remote work environment and trying to deal with all these uh, big processing tasks. Um, 
So we've expanded the Southeast, you know, to include say up through the Ohio uh, and into the, uh, the rest of the South Atlantic so that um, folks in the region would have cons this consistent information that was done primarily for the GCPO. They would have that for the rest of the Southeast. Now we will say a bonus is the fact that as we were doing this and processing these things, we went ahead and processed the country. So that's uh, added a little more time, but I think hopefully that's a lot more benefit, um, you know, and add, added benefit to this, this study um, <clears throat> with the same, you know, objectives as, as the first, as the first phase. So not doing any further expansion beyond say the spatial. Uh, we were at this point, when we went back, we were able to fill in a few of the other uh, scenarios that weren't available back in 2014. Or, um, and, but we still kept those same 13 GCMs uh, as, as a part of this study. Again, looking at the dynamic land cover, cover type uh, across the country and how that changes. Uh, potential changes and how that affects the model parameterization, uh, impervious area, seeing how how we you know they would think these these urban centers are growing and, and definitely would affect say the hydrology the hydrologic response. And the calibration we did we have added more of these ancillary data sets so we start you know trying to optimize fit soil moisture and recharge as well as runoff, actually evapotranspiration and snow covered area. Um, so those are some other things that we've we've been able to, to try and get a better representation that the model objectives are not just about stream flow, but it's about representing a hydrologic cycle. So there may be some compromise with stream flow simulation as we you know, add more of those things to the objective function, but hopefully getting a, a better representation uh, in general of the hydrologic cycle. So as far as temperature changes out of you know this this add-on, so you know we've broken. So as far as temperature, you know we've we've now we're, we're summarizing these by not only season but also by the RCPs. Looking at that still that that 2060 window, so 2045 to 2075, and so you know you kind of see the the changes across the country even by season, and and what areas may see more more effects um, than others. And then, you know, along with that, changes in precipitation going forward. And then the other piece that I didn't show for this, this follow-on work is that, you know, this again is say the median per RCP, but then we still need to consider that range. You know, what's the maximum range across the GCM simulations for each of those and, and have those uh, represented as well. And then, you know, representing this, you know, historical runoff yield out of the observation simulation you know, matching the general patterns that we've we've seen in the past. You know, the east and the southeast and the Pacific Northwest tend to dominate as far as uh, runoff yield, and then that aggregated up to the stream flow network, which is probably what folks would more, be more interested in uh, from a management perspective. Is you know, on the in in stream flows as opposed to uh, the landscape. So again, summary report, a data release uh, initially be on science based, but I think we really would like to explore better and more efficient ways to share this information um, than just these huge files on, on say, science base. Uh, management applications, uh, you know, uh, get word, you know, species status assessments efforts going on a Fish and Wildlife Service could potentially use some of these outputs. I mean, I think that was probably in the GCPO effort, you know, one of the uh, focus to where these could be used at the next step. Um, then from the park service, you know, we were we were talking with the park service over the past few years. And at the time, all we had was the monthly water balance model for the country, and they're looking at what are the potential changes to where their national parks are, uh, um, you know, and and how they manage those into the future uh, across the country. And so, with this daily information now uh, coming available at the the national scale, you know. Can they can take that next step and and see where that ties in, or can provide more insight than than just the monthly water, the monthly time step information. So future directions, uh, we're looking at, you know, we've done some updates to the underlying geospatial fabric. Uh, if you remember, noticed in the previous one, the Canadian catchments and and the catchments that went into Mexico tend to just have very large units. Uh, we spent some time last year improving 
making those Canadian catchments, especially for the Pacific Northwest, the same spatial resolution as what we have for the conterminous US. Um, but then the question is, though we picked a, a particular resolution, that may not be the resolution that folks need at the management level. And so those information would be good to know as we move forward in you know, developing these underlying fabrics. There's still several other you know, GCMs that we didn't run. So we ran 13 GCMs with 48 future scenarios, but the total number available in CMIT 5 is 44 with 134 future scenarios. So there could be an expansion across applied models. And then we still, in general, you know, looking to improve the hydrologic process representation, knowing that you know, we're not representing flow regulation, water use effects, and, and those you know, I'm sure play large roles in, in places that folks need information. And then again, this, this efficient data sharing and mechanisms, uh, I think is huge going forward. Um, this high-speed computing cluster that was stood up for USGS, the Yeti, uh, was stood up in 2011, 2012, that really gave us the ability to, um, to run these larger applications. Now USGS has a next version called Denali that's even larger and faster that we're trying to move our things over to. Uh, so some of these things are beyond, yeah, the, capacity of just our, our local workstations and the geodata portal uh, still still handy for summarizing climate information. Uh, laundry list of collaborators over both efforts and, and into the future uh, from government, non-government, academia, international, um, and then all the folks that have kind of come and gone on the, these, these projects and efforts. Um, it's just been an amazing, you know, amazing collaboration bringing all these folks together to, to get all this done. And I think that's all I have for, for now. Uh, thank you for your time. I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Well, thanks so much, Jacob. Um, great presentation. Lots of information there. <laughs> um, yeah, so we do have um, some time for questions now. Um, if you want to ask a question, you could um, raise your hand in the participant box. I think we have a relatively manageable um, crowd and you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly um, or feel free to um, put it in the chat box. So um, I see one in the chat. I don't know if you are if you're able to see the chat, um, Jacob, but I can read um, a question that's come into the chat out to you. Um, Richard says, I noticed in the maps of model performance within the GCPO area, that there seem to be geographic differences in the results from drier Texas to wet, wetter Eastern areas. You right, yes, that? that's, uh, in, in, it's typically what we've seen and not only with, let's say PRMS, but even other, say national scale applications with the water balance model or um, uh, even like a SWOT application that these models tend to do generally just do better in wetter areas. Um, so yeah, the east, the southeast, the Pacific Northwest, those tend to be the places where the models do the best. And as we try to get to those arid, those semi-arid regions, um, these current conceptualizations that are more surface water driven uh, really could probably benefit from being coupled with groundwater uh, models or, or have improved uh, processes from from that perspective I think that's a, that's a lot of a lot of what we're seeing is, is missing some of those arid to semi area processes in those those surface water models okay. Thanks. Um, I'll pause here and see if it's anyone who wants to raise their hand or you can go ahead and directly unmute yourself ask a question of Jacob. Hi, yeah. Jacob. This, this is Dan. Um, I was wondering, it looked like you used uh, the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency to evaluate models, but then, you know, you also looked at things like maximum flow rates and, and the distribution of the flows when evaluating the models. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about how you balanced those two different requirements that they sometimes give conflicting um, assessments of you know which which model formulation was best right so yeah as far as the model yeah evaluation you were typically looking at Nash Sutcliffe percent bias um, but within the actual calibration procedure we 
we typically optimize to normalize root mean square error. Um, but so, so that tends to maybe help smooth some of those extremes since, yeah, Nash Sutcliffe, especially if you're just using the actual flows, right, you tend to wait the high flow days, get weighted a lot more than the low flow days. Um, and, and when we've looked at evaluations with, say, the log of the flows with Nash Sutcliffe, we tend to see, yeah, the, the performance decrease some just because, you know, as the these surface water models you know, tend to um, get those higher upper range flows better than, than say the, the sustained flow flows. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it'd be nice to, you know, cause there's a kind of a laundry list of, of metrics that I think we could look at. And, um, but yeah, those just kind of a couple of the, uh, the low hanging fruit ones that we typically see in the literature. So. Uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any follow up to that? Okay. So here's another um, question in the chat. Um, sorry if I missed this, but how do you account for dams in your flow stream flow calibration process? Yeah, so that's uh, one of a few caveats or limitations in that that current application that is that it's yeah we don't we don't have flow regulation and we don't have water use effects in those simulations. So it is looking at uh, changes in naturalized flow regimes. And, and so considering that when, when you look at the model outputs, you know, that there may be areas that even though we, we have time series to, you know, to represent each of those model units, there may be parts of the region that with those assumptions, you know, that we don't consider those things in that current one um, to definitely you know, it may not be appropriate to use that information at, at a particular spot that is flow regulated. Okay, thanks. Um, so Yvonne, you wanna unmute yourself and ask yeah, another hi. question? Thanks, thanks Jacob, great presentation. I, I, I always learn something new when I, when I see this again and again. <laughs> um, the, and, uh, you know, it's been, this information has been extremely valuable for Fish and Wildlife Service applications. Um, it, it seems like, you know, and, and this probably speaks to the, the uh, question from Brad as well. You know, there are a couple of things that, you know, maybe including uh, water withdrawals or including dams, including, um, you know, different methods for arid, uh, metrics in arid areas and including different IHA metrics. Of those, um, I guess I've gotten requests for different IHA metrics. Um, what of those kind of suite of options would you consider as easiest to incorporate into future advancements in this? I, I keep asking for more, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know that's all right. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as like in the workflow, you know, adding more statistics off the stream flow, you know, that's probably, you know, the, the lowest hanging fruit, I would say, um, since, you know, we already have the script set up to process those 52. So if it's 52 or it's, you know, 60 or whatever, um, that, that doesn't seem like it adds too much to the overhead. Um, as far as like water use flow regulation, you know, on other efforts, say even, you know, in our, in, in my sphere of things I work on, and USGS is part of like the National Water Census, you know, there's, there's a pretty significant investment in water use uh, modeling and development that they're trying to get, you know, national coverage at, you know, shorter time scales from a modeling perspective. So. It'd really be interesting when those things get finished. You know, can we, you know, plug those in to um, to a modeling application like this to to get that that piece considered? As far as the the flow regulations, um, it's something that's been on our list. It seems like for years, and you know, there are some capabilities within PRMS to to add that fun, you know, add that functionality as far as you know, even if it's like replacement flows out of reservoirs or, you know, having some perhaps simplistic representation of those reservoirs. But if it gets to like rule curves and management of flows, 
um, there was uh, some recent development that coupled, say, PRMS and, and, and ModFlow and, and GSFlow with ModSim, which is one of those uh, management uh, frameworks or tools, kind of you know, like a ResSim, but different. Um, so I think an effort like that could, could be worthwhile to try to get, you know, to actual flows. That seems to be a big question all the time. You know, it's like, yeah, we're kind of, we're still living in this, this natural flows realm, but what folks need is actual flows. So, so that would definitely be the heavier lift, I think. Yeah, great, thanks. thanks. John, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, Jake, this is uh, John Pastini. Um, thanks for, uh, yeah, this, uh, another great presentation. Um, it's amazing all the work that, you, that your huge team has done. Um, I was curious, so from an end user kind of perspective, I, I recall since there was there were some tools that you had for evaluating, you know, which metrics um, were more reliable and where those were. So if somebody, you know, was interested in a particular area that, you know, they can look at where, you know, what metrics might be more reliable. Um, but I don't recall what that was, but that, that seems to me that that's the sort of thing that, that a lot of folks might need to know about or, um, you know, it, to make the data more, more, uh, more usable and, and, you know, know what you can trust and what you probably shouldn't trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, some of that, like the, the KS test analysis that we did of, you know, the historical observation based run versus the historical GCMs as a starting point. And you know that that criteria that we had as far as you know seventy five percent of the units for seventy five percent of the GCMs, you know that's kind of a rule of thumb that for better or worse we we just kind of you know decided on if there's other criteria that make more sense or um, that come out of the other research communities that would be nice that would be good I think because I think there are differences of you know can be differing opinions on you know if you match historical you feel good about the future. If you don't match historical conditions, do you feel better about the future? So there's that perspective as well as the range across the different runs, right? So mm -hmm. when oftentimes we're kind of looking at the median of a particular set of simulations, we still need to consider the range across those. So yeah, for, for users thinking about both of those, you know, can the models mm -hmm. represent those? And then how do the models range for your particular area of interest? Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thanks. This is a good conversation. We're coming up to the hour, so I'll see if there's another quick question that um, anyone wants to pose, and then otherwise we'll um, move on through. I, if if there is no one, I would like to ask sort of to you, Jacob, and also to maybe to the group convened here, how best to sort of determine what type of, of use you know usability tool or, or user tool is would be most effective and then we heard a couple of things about you know maybe some of this evaluation of metrics in a particular region but how best to get at that answer of of where to position this so that it's most usable to the stakeholders at large so i think what i've seen you know with with say the conservation planning atlas that, that they, you know the, the application that yvonne stood up i think that's great to, you know, so that you can get the general idea in your area um, as far, yeah. But then it's like when folks want the underlying data sets, that really becomes the challenge. And I think to this point when we've had requests, I think it's it's kind of been, yeah, Yvonne's kind of <laughs> taken, taken that on as far as, you know, subsetting for folks. And I think that subsetting is a very valuable piece that we should definitely try to get in some kind of official structure. And Yvonne, yeah. maybe you have something to speak to that. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's been really good because we have had a couple, um, you know, mostly it's been for SSA requests, which is kind of a narrow subset of requests. But yeah, I have like an R script to just pull the data. Um, but, but getting that into, you know, finding a, a home for these kind of outputs with some sort of interactive script that allows the user to select like um do you want you know f future scenarios with all the ranges you know how 
summarize to what level, if we can have something like that, that would be, um, I think, really appreciated. And um, like I said, I think we now have a little bit of uh, user feedback on what people are looking for, um, at least from the SSA perspective, that can inform that the structure of the kind of a interface. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so I guess to re respect people's time, we'll go ahead and close out. And um, Ashlyn, if you want to sort of share out that last, um, Jake, if you want to stop your share and let Ashlyn share that last screen, just to sort of um, talk about our our next seminar. So. Yes. Can you see that okay, Carrie? Yep. Okay, awesome. Um, and yeah, thank you, Jacob, for that wonderful presentation this morning. That was really interesting. I appreciate you taking the time to share with us today. Um, and just to quickly wrap up, I noticed we're over time. Um, I just want to preview the next webinar in our series. So next month, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Suresh Subedi, an assistant professor at Arkansas Tech, Tech University. Um, he's going to be presenting on the CCAST project, Developing Future Habitat Condition Scenarios for Wildlife in the Imperiled Pine Rockland Ecosystem of South Florida. So you can get more information and register for this, web for this webinar on our website. We're going to um, share the link in the chat. It's also right here um, on the screen and of course linked out on our homepage, which is just ccast.ncsu.edu. Um, and just a quick note that by registering for this webinar, you're also going to be added to our newsletter mailing list so you can learn more about upcoming seminars and events we have going on. Of course, you're welcome to unsubscribe yourself at any time, but we do hope you stick around just to stay connected with what we've got going on here. So um, thank you everybody for tuning in and joining us today. Uh, thanks again, Jacob, for that wonderful presentation. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.